Hi, Niklas. Hi, uh, Peder. Uh, very nice to have you here in, in, uh, during the summer for a, a quick uh, discussion on, on, on Achetes Therapeutics, a bit on, on what has happened and, and also your progress. Uh, brief reminder, uh, we came out with an update in uh, June now, adjusting our estimates, which were a bit too conservative in the beginning. We, for instance, assumed uh, as many patients on drug in 26 as the company has now shown already uh, to have on drug in, in their uh, main patient uh, programs, uh, compassionate use kind of program. Uh, and adjusting the estimates, we, we got to uh, a fair uh, commercial base case success value of uh, 39 sec. Uh, that, that's where we think the, the company uh, will head to. And uh, uh, yeah, so also on the uh, voucher side, so we, we know that the M MC Tate uh, is highly likely to, to uh, trigger a rare pediatric disease voucher to, to the company. Uh, that is usually then sold by the smaller company to a, a pharma uh, company. And, and we saw these things happening recently quite a lot. And usually it is around uh, above $100 million. Uh, one uh, recently by Novartis was bought, I think, for exactly $100 million. And we assume they're uh, for now still uh, only uh, $80 million, which would be around $40 million to achieve these therapeutics. And with that, uh, I would like to open up the interview and, and just ask you, uh, could you go through uh, the process a bit of uh, what has happened since the Chitis has formed, which is now uh, close to uh, two years? Great, and thank you very much for hosting us today, Dan. So quite a lot has happened. But let us take a recap. So the, the merger between Plaid Pharma and Rare Thyroid Therapeutics took place back end of, of 2020, so roughly a year and a half ago, uh, and hence the formation of Aegetes Therapeutics. Uh, the core focus, of course, initially was to integrate the two organizations, but also, of course, with the lead asset, MCTATE, trying to optimize the regulatory pathway up until approval, which I believe we made tremendous progress with, and we've been very successful where we announced the outcome in Europe after a pre-submission meeting with the EMA in December 2021, where we have a very clear regulatory pathway to approval based on clinical data already available. And there we saw that that substantially increased the probability of success or decreased the risk, of course, in a, in a potential approval by the EMA having all clinical data already at hand. Then one can ask yourself, of course, why don't you submit today? Which is a very important question, since we have all the clinical data already available. And that is purely driven by the, the part of the dossier that is CMC. So the CMC module where we are weighting stability data. And hence why we see a submission in first half of 2023 uh, for approval in Europe. Along those lines, we also had in parallel discussion with, with the FDA, which was very positive discussions, where they also acknowledge that the treatment effects on chronic thyroid toxicosis and the related clinical manifestation will also be a basis for market approval. However, in the contrast to the EMA, they requested a short pivotal study, 30-day randomized study with 16 patients to verify these results we have seen in the previous clinical studies in a randomized setting. And that study has been something we've been worked on during the spring, and we will initiate that uh, early autumn this year, looking forward to results from that clinical study in the beginning of 2024, which as of 2023, which leaves, leads us to a submission mid-2023. All that in, in context leads us to, uh, to a potential approval in, in both jurisdictions, more or less around the same time. So in Europe and in the US, we're looking forward to an approval early 2024. So a lot has happened on that, that side as well. When it comes to the, to the ongoing clinical study, uh, TRIAC trial two, where we're looking at establishing the effects on neurocognitive development, that study has been fully recruited during quarter two, 
uh, and that's a 96 weeks follow up, of course, for all patients or so for the last patient coming into that. We're looking forward then to results in the first half of 2024, which will be very important for us, of course, to establish and recognize the effects on neurocognitive development. But we are not dependent on that study for a potential market approval. However, the results will be very important in, of course, pricing and reimbursement discussions with the uh, relative healthcare uh, authorities. That to a side, we also have the, the name patient use program on the compassionate use program, where we see, continue to see, I would say, substantial increase from treating physicians around the world. Today, we have more than 160 patients being treated in more than 26 countries around the world with MCT8 for MCT8 deficiency. And that's an incredible increase compared to only 12 months ago. It's more than 50% increase uh, over the last 12 months. And we continue to see that evolve going forward. Right. So I think that's in summary how we see the progress made, which again has been tremendous. And, and moving forward to, to a submission for approval uh, within the coming period. Thank you. Uh, that sounds uh, very impressive, uh, especially the increase in patients. That really shows that you're able to uh, get to these patients, which is uh, often difficult for uh, rare disease, uh, very rare disease uh, companies. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, do you have any other plans? Uh, <coughs> Very sorry about that. Uh, do you have any other plans uh, besides uh, MCT8 with MCT8? Uh, we have seen that you uh, got the orphan drug designation this year in both uh, Europe and the US for uh, RTH beta. Can you explain a bit about uh, this disease and is there a, maybe a family of diseases that you could address with MCT8? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so, so RTH beta is a it's a related disease, you can say. I mean, the, the symptomatology is not very different, but it's a very distinct disease, so, so it's a different mutation. So RTH beta is actually mutations in the receptor for thyroid hormone, while MCT8, as you uh, probably know by now, is, is the mutations in the transporter, uh, which brings the thyroid hormone into the cells. So, so uh, just important to underline that these patient populations, they, they, they are completely distinct, right? So there is no overlap uh, be between the two. And, and what we have seen is uh, we have a number of case reports where, where we have seen that um, uh, MCT8 is able to uh, bypass the, the mutation in the uh, thyroid hormone receptor in, in, RK, in, in the majority of, of mutations in RTH beta patients. So, so uh, we think that there is a, um, a very interesting opportunity to explore here uh, to, to move the product into uh, a similar, uh, slightly more prevalent disease than, than MCT8 deficiency, and, and we are currently looking at how we would best go about uh, doing that in the, in the most efficient way. Uh, so, so asking uh, to a gen more general question, is there a family of diseases? Well, I mean, uh, this is a, a uh, uh, our substance is a thyromimetic. I mean, theoretically, we could look at other uh, thyroid hormone disturbances, uh, and we may find additional opportunities there. Uh, I think MCT8 deficiency and RTH beta are the most uh, closer ones where we have more data also in humans and, and, and I mean, are, are the obvious first ones to, to go for, uh, not excluding that there could be potentially other uh, interesting disease areas where thyroid hormone, I mean, is a ubiquitous hormone. It's, it's important for many, many different processes and, and uh, disturbances in, in thyroid hormone signaling is, is, is quite common actually, uh, even if each disease is uncommon. Uh, so, so we'll certainly continue to look for, for interesting uh, areas for life cycle management. Interesting. And that will, of course, then uh, further increase the, the market size that you can ad address. And uh, I guess all the work that you did now uh, within MCT8 regulatory wise and, and clinical data wise will, of course, be supportive in yes. any other effort. Um, yeah, so I think well, one question always is uh, what, what are the next triggers? So what can we expect in the second half of this year? What can we expect in 23? And, and yeah, as we know, the, the big events then uh, come in 24 with uh, approval and commercialization. But, but what, is, what can we expect for, for the near term uh, future? So, so for the near term, it's a very good question, Dan. Thank you. So, so for the near term, looking at the second half, of course, of 
of 2023, uh, the one that is most imminent is, of course, the, the initiation of the short pivotal study in the US, the 30 days randomized control study with 16 patients. And they were looking at initiating that study and dosing the first patients already early autumn with subsequent results then, <coughs> excuse me, in the beginning of, of 2023. So I think that's the most prevalent one. Then of course we have our second asset in Aladot where we most recently received uh, orphan drug designation in Europe, in addition to the orphan drug designation already received by the US FDA in 2019. So they were looking at, uh, at initiating a pivotal study for, for Aladot in the indication of prevention of acute liver injury caused by paracetamol poisoning. So that's also in the second half of 2023. Then when we move into, sorry, 20, 2022, then when we move into 2023, of course, the key major trigger points will be first half submission to the European Medicine Agency for MCT for the treatment of MCT deficiency and the same to the FDA uh, mid-2023. So that's how we see the coming 12 month planning out. And of course, that's very much in focus for, for the organization. Having said that, that two side, of course, the other key piece, which is maybe not as news prevalent, is of course the responsible commercial build-up that we're doing stepwise. And you've seen some news already taking place in, in April as well as June, where we have the, now the core team established in the commercial space. Since we are planning to launch MCT in US and in Euro Europe by ourselves, so driving that core team, further expanding that uh, organization, planning for a successful, successful launch for MCT is, of course, vital for us. Absolutely. That's, I think, we have a very positive aspect that we can see uh, that you're building up both the patient population and, and yeah, uh, preparing for commercialization, patient education, and uh, that you can actually uh, start selling the day you get the approval. Uh, and the last question, uh, that is the funding situation. So you closed recently a uh, rights issue in a very tough market in a, in a very good way. Uh, and uh, you will uh, most likely to be uh, be eligible for, uh, uh, for a rare pediatric disease uh, priority review uh, voucher. And uh, uh, what, what can we expect here in terms of uh, funding? Uh, do, do you need more uh, cash before 24? Or, or do you think this is uh, with the current plans uh, enough? And, yeah. Of course, and thank you again, a very good question. And then just to reiterate what you said yourself, we're very pleased actually with closing the preferential rights issue in May, uh, raising an additional 180 million Swedish kronos gross, obviously in very tough market conditions. I think the outcome showed that there's very, very much interest from institutional investors in the company. We are very grateful to Flairy Invest that increased their, their stake in the company, but also welcome a new investor in Link AB that took a substantial share of the preferential rights issue. So of course that, that, that is very positive for us uh, when it comes to cash burn rate and, and, and the, 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 the long term from a funding perspective. Uh, you're going to get a very diplomatic answer here in the sense it all depends. It depends on how quick we ramp up uh, the commercial infrastructure, how much do we invest upfront compared and when compared to around launch, etc. But we, we have enough funding that takes us way back into back end of 2023, at least, I would say today. Obviously, then you recognize yourself, which is very important for us as a company that we are eligible for a priority review voucher in the US, which of course for a company like ours, one could assume that that would be sold and that could be sold more or less a month after a potential US approval. So we're looking at that then potentially early 2024 and that will generate of course a substantial inflow of cash around the region of 50 million US dollars. So that's how we see from a financial situation, the, the both short to midterm future. Thank you very much. Uh, very informative and uh, all the best. Thank you very Thank much, you. Dan.